Let's go to the movies, everyone, at least in this segment. Box office receipts are down this year as more films are being streamed by Netflix and other providers, and lots of people stay home instead of heading to the theaters. That, despite the fact that Avengers Endgame is still the highest grossing film of all time, raking in nearly a billion dollars domestically and nearly three billion worldwide. Let's bring in our guest to discuss. Rich, Rich recently spoke with Rick Unger. Rick was the president of Marvel uh, Character Group in the 90s and again from the years 2000 to 2003. All right, Rick, I, I wanted to pick your brain um, on some movie questions since you were the president of Marvel Character Group in the 90s and again from the years 2000, 2003. Um, first off, did you have any sense 20 years ago that it would have turned into the monolith that it's become? Well, you know, it's hard to answer that question. We all believed that this kind of success was possible. But I have to tell you, 20 years ago, the rights were in such disarray that many of us who ended up being a part of making it happen didn't know if we'd ever get the chance to. So, yeah, we always thought it could be successful. The monolith it's become, I'm not sure anybody was thinking quite that big. But did you think, for example, I get my son getting into it, but even my daughters have seen just about every one of the Marvel films and the franchises and their connectivity. That I thought there was going to be more of a self-selecting audience, but it has crossed over in so many ways. That's what surprised me. You go back 20, 30, 40 years ago, it was a unique number of people who could name who was in the Avengers. Now, you know, I defy somebody, even a, a casual person, not to be able to name three or four of them. Well, you know what? It, it's interesting, and I'll, I'll tell you a personal story. We always worried about that, but we knew that the Marvel formula, the way the characters were built, the way the stories were built, there's major, major aspects of almost every single story that's a love story. You can go through each and every one of them, and you will find it. Also, there is the part of every single Marvel character that those other guys, those DC guys, missed for a long time time, which is creating characters who become superheroes but have real-life problems. Everybody can relate to real-life problems. So I remember when I went to the Spider-Man premiere, and my wife, of course, came with me, and I didn't know if she was going to like the film, but, you know, I was president of the company. You got to go to the premiere. She absolutely loved it, and she has loved most of the Marvel films since. There is something in the Marvel characters and in the Marvel storylines that appeals not only to, to demographics in terms of sex, but various ages. Everybody thinks that they were for kids. They were never just for kids. That's not who these characters are. It was always teenagers who would have the most emotional attachment. They understood what Peter Parker was going through and trying to be Spider-Man and have a relationship at the same time. They got that. But so did people who were older than them and so do people who are younger than them. Uh, you mentioned the rights mess, et cetera. Uh, Stan Lee, rest his soul, beloved figure. A few, I, I've heard a few across word about him. Uh, but did it need somebody like a Feige or whatever to take the conceptual that really hadn't translated a film that well over the years? Cartoons maybe, but never to the big screen. Uh, what got it over the hump after acquiring all the rights, which in and of itself was a major hurdle? Well, I would credit two people, and I'm not including myself because I really spent most of my time at Marvel. Uh, I was on the television side. I, they tell me I've written and produced more cartoons for TV than anybody on the planet. That's a function of age. The two people who I think deserve the credit are a gentleman named Avi Arad, who was the original really the guy who pushed it to make the movies happen and then had the creative abilities along with other people to bring them to life and make them just fantastic. Kevin Feige began as Avi's assistant and Kevin turned out, he had learned the movie business, he had worked with the Donners. Uh, Mrs. Donner was a, a producer, her husband was one of the great film directors. So he had learned the film business, but he has this innate skill. I mean, Kevin and I have had some funny conversations. When I heard that Guardians of the Galaxy was going to be a film, I called him, I said, Kevin, you jumped the shark. This one's not going to work. He says, yeah, it's going to be huge. Kevin was right. I was wrong. He has a phenomenal sense 
of the characters and a phenomenal sense of uh, how to build the movies. But I'll tell you what, it was Avi Arad who, without whom, I would say we never would have had what the Marvel Universe has turned out to be filmically. Well, speaking to that, what was your reaction when Scorsese said it wasn't real cinema? Well, you know what, I don't take those things all that seriously because I don't think, you know, as you know all too well, I, I have a very different life these days than uh, the movie world and the TV world. It's, it's a whole other thing. I don't care if that's his opinion. Fine. I, I, you know, all I know is the movies are great. The movies are entertaining. The movies make tons of money. And if that's not cinema to Martin Scorsese, that's cool. I like his movies, too. You know, it's funny. When you see, take the Marvel movies in the cinema, it's a very different experience than when you see it at home. And this whole transition to streaming, and take The Irishman, the latest Scorsese movie, the idea, first of all, three and a half hours is one thing if you're locked into the movie, you're committed to it, but there's too many distractions at home to consume that level of it. You lose the art of it and, and the cinematography and the sound and the experience of a Marvel movie, different when you see it in, like I said, your living room. Are you concerned that the consumption models, while suiting maybe the consumer of today's inattentiveness maybe, but or need for comfort attached to it, will take away from the experience itself. It's a trade-off, it really is. On the one hand, screens, your television screen, are getting so large that the technical issue of not being able to see and experience everything you do in the theater, that's becoming less of a problem. It really is. I've been playing with it because I, I got Disney Plus or whatever it's called. So I've been re-watching a lot of Marvel movies. It's not exactly the same. On the other hand, having that opportunity uh, and the quality of streaming today makes up for a lot of it. I'll tell you what, I would predict to you, you, you and I recall when television came around and got to be such a big deal, everybody was saying, well, there goes the movie theaters, and they never went away. I don't think they're gonna go away now. There is still a, a, a bit of magic, not only in the way you can present a piece of film in a movie theater on that very large screen with that amazing sound. You can't copy that in the average household. And, and you still have people wanna go on dates. People wanna get out of the house. That's not gonna go away. So I think that the streaming opportunities will probably still come primarily into play um, with movies that have already been in the theaters, but you will see some. The Irishman released on Netflix uh, pretty much at the same time as the theater. I watched it on Netflix. I loved it. Uh, it did not diminish the story for me at all. But, you know, sound quality was not a huge issue in that movie. So it just, I think it's going to depend on the film itself and how the technology advancements come in terms of building your system at home to replicate the movie theater. Last thing for me, Rick. Did they really plan out the phases in such a way that over 20-something films that they, they knew what, what the next step was going to be the whole time? They had to make up some of it as they went along and as they prepared to do it yet again with new characters and everything else. Did they really have that amount of foresight? I, it sounds like a great story, but films, oh my God, that's impossible, no. right? No, not 20 films worth, because bear in mind, I mean, you're talking about, what, 20 films is how many years? You don't even know who the writers are going to be once you get past the next film. So they do have story arcs, and I know that they planned out, you know, you take something like The Avengers. I think that's a good example. Uh, the Avengers, you make the first one, you don't know how well it's going to do, so you're not planning a lot. You figure it'll do okay, so you, can, you tie your actors up for, let's say, three films, and that probably is the story arc arc that you begin to think through. If the first one works, where are we going with the second? Where are we going with the third one? After that, it's, it's really impossible. You don't know what actors are going to fall out, and that's going to change characters. After that third one, you have no idea what it's going to cost to keep Robert Downey Jr. wanting to be Iron Man. You just, there are so many unknowns, you really can't plan the story arc that far in advance. Listen. The fact that they made Ant-Man into a successful movie and, and, yeah, and a series. And it was great. It, exactly. I, I am completely in on wherever they go from here. But, Rick, always love talking to you. Thank you so much for the time. You got it. Take care. And we'll be right back to wrap up RFL right after this.